Chapter 9 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towel. Chapter 9 In Which the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean Prove Propitious to the Designs of Phileas Fogg. The distance between Suez and Aden is precisely thirteen hundred and ten miles, and the regulations of the company allow the steamers one hundred and thirty-eight hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to reach her destination considerably within that time. The greater part of the passengers from Brindisi were bound for India, some for Bombay, others for Calcutta, by way of Bombay the nearest route thither now that a railway crosses the indian peninsula among the passengers was a number of officials and military officers of various grades the latter being either attached to the regular british forces or commanding the sepoy troops and receiving high salaries ever since the central government has assumed the powers of the east india company for the sub-lieutenants get two hundred eighty pounds brigadiers twenty four hundred pounds and generals of divisions four thousand pounds what with the military men a number of rich young englishmen on their travels and the hospitable efforts of the purser the time passed quickly on the mongolia the best of fare was spread upon the cabin tables at breakfast lunch dinner and the eight o'clock supper and the ladies scrupulously changed their toilets twice a day, and the hours were whirled away when the sea was tranquil with music, dancing, and games. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous like most long and narrow gulfs. When the wind came from the African or Asian coast, the Mongolia with her long hull rolled fearfully. Then the ladies speedily disappeared below, the pianos were silent, singing and dancing suddenly ceased. Yet the good ship ploughed straight on, unretarded by wind or wave, towards the straits of Babel Mandeb. What was Phileas Fogg doing all this time? It might be thought that, in his anxiety, he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind, the disorderly raging of the billows, every chance, in short, which might force the Mongolia to slacken her speed, and thus interrupt his journey but if he thought of these possibilities he did not betray the fact by any outward sign. Always the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise, as unvarying as the ship's chronometers, and seldom having the curiosity even to go up on the deck, he passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference did not care to recognize the historic towns and villages which, along its borders, raised their picturesque outlines against the sky, and betrayed no fear of the dangers of the Arabic Gulf, which the old historians always spoke of with horror, and upon which the ancient navigators never ventured without propitiating the gods by ample sacrifices. How did this eccentric personage pass his time on the Mongolia? He made his four hearty meals every day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself. A tax collector on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier general of the English army who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares, made up the party and with Mr. Fogg played whist by the hour, together in absorbing silence. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, for he was well fed and well lodged, took a great interest in the scenes through which they were passing, and consoled himself with the delusion that his master's whim would end at Bombay. He was pleased on the day after leaving Suez to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays. "'If I am not mistaken,' said he, approaching this person, with his most amiable smile, "'you are the gentleman who so kindly volunteered to guide me at Suez. Ah, I quite recognize you. You are the servant of the strange Englishman. Just so, Monsieur Fix.' "'Monsieur Fix,' resumed Passepartout, I'm charmed to find you on board. Where are you bound? Like you, to Bombay? That's capital. Have you made this trip before? 
several times i am one of the agents of the peninsular company then you know india why yes replied fix who spoke cautiously a curious place this india oh very curious mosques minarets temples fakers pagodas tigers snakes and elephants i hope you will have ample time to see the sights i hope so monsieur fix you see a man of sound sense ought not to spend his life jumping from a steamer upon a railway train and from a railway train upon a steamer again pretending to make the tour of the world in eighty days no all these gymnastics you may be sure will cease at bombay and mr fogg is getting on well asked fix in the most natural tone in the world quite well and i too i eat like a famished ogre it's the sea air but i never see your master on deck never he hasn't the least curiosity do you know mr passepartout that this pretended tour in eighty days may conceal some secret errand perhaps a diplomatic mission faith monsieur fix i assure you i know nothing about it nor would i give half a crown to find out after this meeting passepartout and fix got into the habit of chatting together the latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence he frequently offered him a glass of whisky or pale ale in the steamer bar-room which passepartout never failed to accept with graceful alacrity mentally pronouncing fix the best of good fellows meanwhile the mongolia was pushing forward rapidly on the thirteenth mocha surrounded by its ruined walls whereon date trees were growing was sighted and on the mountains beyond were espied vast coffee fields passepartout was ravished to behold this celebrated place and thought that with its circular walls and dismantled fort it looked like an immense coffee cup and saucer the following night they passed through the strait of babel mandab which means in arabic the bridge of tears and the next day they put in at steamer point northwest of aden harbor to take in coal this matter of fueling steamers is a serious one at such distances from the coal mines it costs the peninsular company some eight hundred thousand pounds a year in these distant seas coal is worth three or four pounds sterling a ton the mongolia had still sixteen hundred and fifty miles to traverse before reaching bombay and was obliged to remain four hours at steamer point to coal up but this delay as it was foreseen did not affect phileas fogg's program besides the mongolia instead of reaching aden on the morning of the fifteenth when she was due arrived there on the evening of the fourteenth a gain of fifteen hours mr fogg and his servant went ashore at aden to have the passport again visaed fix unobserved followed them the visa procured mr fogg returned on board to resume his former habits while passepartout according to custom sauntered about among the mixed population of somalis banyans parsis jews arabs and europeans who comprised the twenty-five thousand inhabitants of aden he gazed with wonder upon the fortifications which make this place the gibraltar of the indian ocean and the vast cisterns where the english engineers were still at work two thousand years after the engineers of solomon very curious very curious said passepartout to himself on returning to the steamer i see that it is by no means useless to travel if a man wants to see something new at six p m the mongolia slowly moved out of the roadstead and was soon once more on the indian ocean she had a hundred and sixty-eight hours in which to reach bombay and the sea was favorable the wind being in the northwest and all sails aiding the engine the steamer rolled but little the ladies in fresh toilets reappeared on deck and the singing and dancing were resumed the trip was being accomplished most successfully and passepartout was enchanted with the congenial companion which chance had secured him in the person of the delightful fix on sunday october twentieth towards noon they came in sight of the indian coast two hours later the pilot came on board a range of hills lay against the sky in the horizon and soon the rows of palms which adorn bombay came distinctly into view the steamer entered the road formed by the islands in the bay and at half-past four she hauled up at the quays of bombay phileas fogg was in the act of finishing the thirty-third rubber of the voyage 
and his partner and himself having by a bold stroke captured all thirteen of the tricks concluded this fine campaign with a brilliant victory the mongolia was due at bombay on the twenty-second she arrived on the twentieth this was a gain to phileas fogg of two days since his departure from london and he calmly entered the fact in the itinerary in the column of gains End of chapter nine